Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We'll be exploring America's Psychic Spy program today. With me is Dr. Ed May, who is the head of research for the Stargate program from 1985 until it closed in 1996. He is also the recipient of a Lifetime Career Award from the Parapsychological Association, and he is the co-author of several books, including ESP Wars East and West, and Anomalous Cognition, Remote Viewing, Research and Theory. He is also the co-editor of a two-volume anthology called Extra Sensory Perception, Support, Skepticism, and Science. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. You have the distinction of having spent your entire adult career as a full-time parapsychologist. That's true. From, I think, 19, late 1975 all the way through 1995, it was a full-blown career. I had no other job but parapsychology. It was quite a privilege. I loved it. And I suppose it's fair to say for any people who are watching the video and are aspiring to such a career, its that's quite rare. Extremely rare. In fact, as far as I know, I might be the only person that had no other job to do. I mean, there have been people in the field around much longer than I've been, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they had nothing other to do than parapsychology. Yeah. Well, in a way, you and I are the inverse of each other because <laughs> I'm the only person with a doctoral diploma that says parapsychology, and I haven't worked one day as a full-time <laughs> paid parapsychologist. <laughs> That's a great point. I'm jealous. I wish I had a diploma also. Mine says physics and no one cares. Yeah. Well, it's important that physicists uh, are involved in the field because the fundamental uh, principles of information transmission that seem to be involved in extrasensory perception uh, require uh, some understanding of physics, and it, it still seems to elude us. Yeah, that's really true. It's a very tough problem. Let, let's suppose someone's going to generate a remote viewing target, per se, mm -hmm. in Bombay, India tomorrow. Yeah. How does that information get from way over there to here now? Big mystery. Mm -hmm. But it does. It does. Yes. At least on occasion. Well, at least on occasion. More than just a few occasions. Mm -hmm. Well, you began your career not doing work in military intelligence. Mm -hmm. You you really were curious about exploring the field of parapsychology. Uh, not true. I'd never heard of it before. <laughs> well, I remember, you know, I knew you back in those days. Oh, not in the early days. Yeah. 1971, you didn't. <laughs> no, I think we met in about 73, Ed. That's true. Really? Okay, yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> I remember introducing you to Uri Geller. Oh, that's also true. Yeah. Uh, I did my first PK experiment when I was a postdoc in physics at the University of California at Davis. Mm -hmm. Long story short, we built the most expensive, uh, elaborate Interstate 80 truck detector. You were working with John Youngerman. I was working with John Youngerman. the physics Youngerman. department there. I remember all of that quite well. I forget it. You, would you please <laughs> tell me what I did back then? <laughs> well, one of the things, as you point out, you, yeah. you discovered that trucks going down Highway 80 were able to disturb this yeah. very sensitive apparatus for measuring PK. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. My real introduction to parapsychology came through Charlie Tart, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Tart at, at UC uh, Herb, uh, Davis. Yes. He uh, had a weekend seminar with outer body experiences, and um, uh, Bob Monroe was the speaker. Mm -hmm. And I arrogantly thought, well, if this businessman can do it, I'm a physicist. I can do that. I bought the book, and I really struggled for about. Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> happened. I put it aside. Mm -hmm. So you're not a, a psychic yourself. Definitely not. But you, eventually you came to become the director for more than a decade of uh, one of the most important uh, parapsychological projects in world history, the United States government's serious effort to understand and apply remote viewing abilities. That's true. Mm -hmm. You want to know how that happened? Yeah. Um, actually, I honor and thank Mr. Ingo Swan, well-known psychic. Mm -hmm. He was the one that actually got me involved in the program at SRI. Mm -hmm. 
They, as I recall, they were testing his psychokinetic abilities right. with a, a very expensive magnetometer. Exactly right. And um, I was an experimental physicist. Hal was an engineer, a very competent Hal put off, and Russ Targ was a physicist. But um, I came in, my job was to find out if, if there was anything wrong with that apparatus, and mm -hmm. if so, what? That mm -hmm. was my job there. Mm -hmm. And so you got, uh, you became a part of the team at SRI, and they were already beginning to do some work for the military intelligence. Uh, it started with the military intelligence. Mm -hmm. Actually, the first funding that Hal put off and Russell Targ got was in late 1972. It was about $195,000 from the CIA. Mm -hmm. They had some private money on the side, but the major thrust was, look, if this stuff were real, and they got interested in it because they saw work uh, that Ingo Swan was doing at the American Society for Psychic Research in New York, and they thought, well, if this is true, we doubt that it is, but if it is true, it has obvious intelligence operation uh, implications. implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they invited Ingo out, and then Pat Price, and the whole history of the program can actually be found in uh, Targan Putoff's book, Mind Reach. Mm -hmm. And you you were part of the project, you were hired on as a, as a physicist and, uh, for about 10 years until you became the director. Correct. Mm -hmm. I joined the program in late 1975, strictly as a consultant. In about 76, they upgraded my status to senior research physicist, and I worked closely with the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Russell Targ left the program in 1982, and Hal left it in 1985, and I became the director of the research mm -hmm. program for the next 10 years. Well, the important thing, I suppose, for students of this history is that the U.S. government funded yeah. this research and applications continuously for over 20 years. Um, I would uh, debate you about the word continuously. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it was like uh, from 1972 to 1995, nominally about $22 million if you add it all up. Mm -hmm. And that sounds great. I mean, it's chump change from the Department of Defense, yeah. but it was a lot of money for us, but it was anything but continuous. There mm -hmm. were long periods of dry spell, and the management was walking up and down the hall asking us, well, you know, you got two weeks before you have to leave, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And so it was came in fits and spurts, but it lasted. And the interesting part is the government funded it basically for that long period of time. and. They did that because they saw some results. Well, a lot of results. And, and in spite of the fact, a lot of people were trying to close us down. Uh -huh. And what protected the program were a few individuals in the government who acted as saviors, if you will, mm -hmm. between our project and the people trying to shut it off. Mm -hmm. Some people very high up in the government. Extremely high up. Mm -hmm. I can mention one now. Um, Secretary of Defense under the Clinton administration, uh, Senator William S. Er, uh, Secretary, Secretary yeah, William S. Cohen. Former senator. Former senator from Maine, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a major supporter, and uh, there was an article in Newsweek in November 1995, or, uh, 2015, where he said how much he supported this program. Mm -hmm. He was one of a large number of protectors. Sadly, he's the only one mm -hmm. I can name right now. Well. The program had, as I understand it, two prongs, so to speak. There was the uh, intelligence applications on the yeah. one hand, and the other hand, pure research designed to try and figure out how this stuff works. Oh, I wish that were true. <laughs> not it's so simple. Not well. Actually, from about ninety, from seventy-two up to the beginning of nineteen eighty-six, that mm -hmm. was not true. We begged to have up money to do research. Yeah. We did all the operational spying, if you will, at that period of time. And we had three, three jobs. Do intelligence collection spying. Mm -hmm. We had what was called foreign assessment. If we could spy, we wanted to assess whether fo other foreigners, like Russia, China, Cuba, mm -hmm. could they do that and was it a threat? And third one was to do operational research, not basic research. Oh, okay. What we had to do is how to make the product better. Mm -hmm. No one was caring how it worked. Yeah. And we fought and screamed about that. And we did a little basic research in, under the name of, well, if the Russians are making that claim, let's see if it really happens. I, because I understand, uh, and I know some of this work is still classified, but during this period, you produced maybe 100 research papers. Oh, more than that. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the interesting thing, is what is now classified. All the research is declassified from 1989 onward. Mm -hmm. There's no secret research. Mm -hmm. 
uh, there's still some secret operations that probably should remain classified. Mm -hmm. But there, we're talking now about nearly 90,000 pages yeah. of research documents yes. and, or operational documents. Yeah. The CIA, in I think it was in 2000, released virtually the entire so-called Stargate record. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should say a Stargate was a nickname. And what does that mean? It's an unclassified nickname. Mm -hmm. There were many. Uh, Gondola Wish. Um, Scan 8. Uh, scan, well, no, that was never a project name. Okay. Uh, Grill Flame, mm -hmm. uh, Sunstreak, and so on. And one is kind of amusing. I walked out of the Pentagon with a colonel, and he said, Hey, we got a whole new name for it. It's called Quantum Leap. I said, oh, gee, do we have to? He said, yeah. And I said, no, no, quantum leap for progress is the smallest possible progress you could have <laughs> above none. Can we rename the project? <laughs> well, we were stuck with it for a while. Well, the program closed in 1996. That's correct. And uh, I'm under the impression that there were a, it was a lot of political pressure at that time. And, uh, well, it's a complex thing. And, you know, uh, there are a number of reasons it closed. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody agrees with me, but here's part of it. During the Cold War, the ap main application was called strategic intelligence. Like, for example, there's a place in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, Semipalatinsk, for example. Mm -hmm. Been there for years and years and years, and everybody was trying to figure out what's going on there. Mm -hmm. That's a strategic problem. After the Cold War was over, there were still some strategic problems, but it shifted more tactical. Like, mm -hmm. where's Saddam Hussein going to be in 20 minutes? Mm. And ESP, I think, is much better at the strategic problem and not very good at the, at the tactical one. So mm -hmm. that was one of the pressures that say, well, wait a minute. Another one is political. Mm -hmm. We have these protectors. Most of those had gone away. Mm -hmm. Uh, thirdly, I think, uh, and I'm not sure everybody agrees with me about this, but um, if you look carefully, uh, we failed at one job. One job was, how can we tell a certain piece of psychic intelligence, is it good or not, a priori before we get any feedback? How much confidence you would That's right. have in that information. We were terrible at that job, mm -hmm. and if you're going to invest resources, you'd better be careful about that. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the operational remote viewings that people talk about and now have been released, and some really stunning ones, were never used in the actual problem. Mm -hmm. It was only after the fact, well, had we used that, it would have been wonderfully mm -hmm. successful. In, in other words, uh, actionable intelligence. Yeah. It was. It would have been actionable, but people did not wish to use it because they didn't have uh, um, confidence mm -hmm. that it would. Let me give you one example, brief okay. one. Uh, one of our uh, super people um, gave me 18 pages spontaneously about an attack on the uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, president. Uh, on attack at the State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a 9-11 scenario. Uh -huh. A plane would fly down the Potomac River and dive at the last minute into the, into the Capitol. Okay. And a lot of details. And I thought, oh, oh gee. You know, frightening what? scenario. Frightening scenario. I went to our DIA mon uh, project monitor, government minder, who was sitting with us all the time, and his name is Jim Salyer. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jim, what do you think of this? And he read it and he said, well, are you handing this to me officially? And I said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, if you're handing this to me officially, we will take action and God help you if we're wrong. Mm -hmm. I had the worst 24 hours of my entire career worrying about that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, uh, elements in that response was that President Reagan would be giving the State of the Union address with a foreign head of government who would be wearing a pink hat. It turned out it was Maggie Thatcher, of course. Oh. And uh, out of this lengthy transcript, that was the only part that was right. I see. And so I did not hand it in, but I was really terrified, literally. Mm -hmm. It bothered me immensely. What if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. And I hold it back and we destroy the whole U.S. government. Well, that's the problem with that sort of information. No matter how it was derived, yeah. uh, uh, there, I understand that in intelligence gathering, you want to have several different independent sources exactly. pointing in the same direction. There were none in this case. Yeah. 
I mean, I had an experience, uh, certainly apart from the intelligence community, in which a psychic called me up and said, Jeffrey, this is the most important message you will ever receive. Oh, no. And you must contact the U.S. government and tell them yeah. not to launch that next space shuttle. Well, that yeah. was about three weeks before the Challenger was launched. Wow, that's impressive. Said if they launch that shuttle, it will be blown out of the sky. Wow, that's really impressive. Yeah. And it would have been nice if you had some, some metric to know whether that was right wrong or indifferent before. And, and at the time, that particular individual, uh, about whom I've written a book called The PK Man, oh, yeah. uh, had been uh, not very accurate. He had yeah. made many inaccurate predictions, and even if he had been highly accurate, certainly no one in the government was about to listen to me. Right. But well, let me tell you, of another case, mm -hmm. uh, uh, General Dozier mm -hmm. was kidnapped off the street by the Red Brigade in Italy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Joe McMonagall uh, worked that problem. Unfortunately, something like 15,000 others would be psychics worked the problem. That happens in every high-profile case. I know. And the uh, Italian police were going bananas. Muddies the, the waters. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. In fact, they said, don't even bring this up anymore. Yeah. It was after the fact that Joe just nailed it. Mm-hmm. And I know you have many cases like that. Exactly. But I gather that in some instances there was uh, action taken. Absolutely. Um, there was a uh, U.S., um, what do you call it, um, drug enforcement case. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Customs or uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, right. one of their agents went bad. A rogue and, agent. rogue agent. And he yeah. was selling drugs and, and mm -hmm. what have you. And he was found out and he fled. There was a nationwide hunt for this guy. Right. And the idea was that he was um, uh, a sailor. So the the smart people, the smart money was that he was roaming around the, uh, the Bahamas or right. somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And long story short, um, Angela Ford, who was one of the best remote viewers that the government had, basically, literally almost, stuck a pin in a map and said, go there and find him. Mm -hmm. They used that with other information, and they went and collected the guy. Mm -hmm. So that that's one of the success yeah. stories. And there are probably a handful of others. And mm -hmm. if there weren't, it would have the program would have died a long time ago. Yeah. Before but that. when the program was closed in 1996, there were uh, there was a review done, yeah. an independent review, yeah. uh, in which uh, the conclusions were kind of mixed, as I recall. Yeah, it was conducted. First of all, the Congress ordered it, uh, mm -hmm. called a congressionally directed activity. Mm -hmm. Came out of the the Senate and said, "Look, CIA, we ask you to please do a 20 year retrospective analysis, and if you believe this is." worthy, mm -hmm. then you are to take over the program from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mm -hmm. Well, it uh, wasn't such a good review. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, they, they only looked at the last year. Mm -hmm. They only looked from the research point of view of the Sense Application International Corporation, only 10 studies. Uh -huh. uh, they only interviewed, I uh, gave them a list of 17 or 18 end user names. They only interviewed one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I walked into a senior senator's office after that, and he said, can you refute this? And I said, yes, it's easy. So he tasked me to write a paper to refute it, and he, quote, told me, pull no punches. Yeah. So I wrote an article in the Journal of Parapsychology, an analysis of them, and it's clear the fix was in before they did the study. In other words, yet. the CIA really didn't want to run yeah. an, an ESP program. Well, uh, I think it's more complicated than that. Uh -huh. uh, for example, uh, do you know what the white crow fallacy is in philosophy? Sure. Yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. well, Let's state it for, for our viewers. The white crow. If I make a, a statement, there are no white crows at all, yep. you can refute my argument by bringing one in. That's, that's <laughs> right. right. If I say all crows are black, yeah. I can disprove that with a single white crow. Exactly. But mm -hmm. if I say, well, there aren't very many white crows, yeah. then we can argue about what it means how many, right? Yeah. I think the CIA made deliberately a white crow problem. Mm -hmm. They knew darn well that it worked. Mm -hmm. The problem is um, a lot of the classification of the Stargate program came about not because we were worried the Soviets would find out or what have you or the Chinese. It was that our Congress would find mm -hmm. out. And we were under threat of Senator, Senator Proxmire's early the Golden Fleece Award. Well, you know, I'm from Wisconsin, yeah. which was uh, Proxmire State, and I remember <laughs> when Hal Putoff came to me and, and he said, we're afraid we're not going to be funded because our sponsors are afraid Senator Proxmire yeah. will award them the Golden Fleece Award. Exactly. So I wrote to Proxmire yeah. myself yeah. and asked him, uh, 
how he felt about the uh, remote viewing research and, and would he, is he considering uh, designating that for the Golden Fleece Award yeah. of government waste. And he wrote back to me and he said, no. He said, I have no intention of awarding the Golden Fleece uh, to the remote viewing program. I, Why didn't you call us up and tell us I that? did. I passed the letter <laughs> okay. with Proxmire's signature on wow. it to Hal Putoff. See, I never knew about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, you were telling me that story. You crummy. Why did you bring this up to him? <laughs> 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 thank you, sir. So, in some some small way I contributed to your uh, ongoing funding. Not in funding. any small way, but the, you know, who, it's nice that we knew about that, yeah. but I don't know how well Hal distributed that among all of our clients. That I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. At the time, I was, uh, I think I was still a graduate student. <laughs> well, I don't care. It was yeah. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the serious part of that, um, I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time in Moscow dealing with former uh, enemies, mm -hmm. now close personal friends. Yeah. They had the same problems we had. Mm -hmm. Everybody was trying to shut them down. Mm -hmm. And so w they were using us the way we were using them to keep the program alive. Well, there's a larger question here, which is, it, are governments really capable of managing programs involving parapsychology? <sighs> Good question. Um, some elements are. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some absolutely brilliant people in the intelligence community, and those people are good managers. The problem is their bosses aren't mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. And what their metrics, I, let me tell one brief story uh, in overview. Mm -hmm. After our, the government program closed down, uh, Joe McMonagall and I spent about a decade trying to get something restarted again. Mm -hmm. And long story short, we had a client in the Pacific who was willing to move forward, and the person said, hey, can you give me political cover uh, in the Pentagon? I said, well, I don't know. So mm -hmm. I went and contacted a person, a friend of mine, and I got dragged around the Pentagon, and an undersecretary of defense said, yes, we'll go forward, no problem. Mm -hmm. I get back to my office, about six weeks later, I get a call from the government, from the Pentagon controller office, mm. the guy with the money, right? Yeah. And he said, well, we're ready to move forward with this $200,000 program, isn't this cool? We will fax you um, the statement of work, what we'd like you to mm -hmm. do for that money. Okay. Yeah. I said, excuse me, I don't have a classified fax. And he said, not to worry, it's unclassified. Mm. I made probably the biggest single mistake in my entire career. What I should have done was to contact the person that got me into the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I did not. I called this major person in the Pacific saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't want this to be unclassified. Yeah. That person withdrew the request and all heck broke loose. They had promised me $10,000 uh, plus uh, expenses to go to the Pacific people mm -hmm. and write this proposal, which ha with uh, Joe and I did. Mm -hmm. Turned out that they didn't like this female officer in the Pacific and this was a way to embarrass her. They, they knew oh. it would be in the in the uh, National Enquirer the next day. Uh, well, that's the problem I think that government people face is embarrassment, the the horse laugh right. factor. Because on on the one side, when it comes to the population as a whole, you've got those who think that this is religiously prohibitive, yeah. the work of the devil. Sure. So, and then you've got the uh, rationalists who who say this is impossible; it couldn't exist at all. It's all fraud. Right. So there's a small group in the middle who can protect you, but only for so long. Except this, it turns out, this whole ex exchange I just described had nothing to do with parapsychology. They hated the girl in the mm -hmm. Pacific. It was a sexist issue. It was office politics. Office politics, and they were going to use us as a sledgehammer. Well, when you add all of these things together, mm -hmm. it's a miracle that the program survived as long as it did. It is a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I believe in miracles? Yes, <laughs> that one I do believe in. <laughs> it seems to me, though, that the day will come, I don't know how long it will take, when uh, governments will reconsider. I believe, I think that's correct. Um, I think if the parapsychology community are successful, this is going to sound strange, we'll put ourselves out of business. Mm -hmm. Because why should I be doing brain studies? I'm a physicist. I hardly know what a brain is. I'm the wrong guy to be doing that. Yeah. People at neuroscience laboratories all over in universities mm -hmm. are the right people to mm -hmm. do that. So if we manage to get this main, the science of it mainstreamed, our job is done mm -hmm. and we, we should pat ourselves on the back. That's your goal. 
Yeah, as a researcher, I, I understand totally. that is is to bring the whole field into mainstream science so that it's no longer even thought of as paranormal. Exactly correct. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's probably the only way it could survive within large public institutions unless there's a huge cultural change. Well, uh, in the U.S. for sure, but as you may know, the private so geographical center of parapsychology research is in the U.K. Right now, and yes. we can thank uh, an expatriate American, the late Bob Morris, for that. Yes, uh, he was the uh, occupier of the chair at the Kersler unit in in uh, University of Edinburgh. That's Edinburgh right. University. Yes. And he spawned, I don't know, something like 50 PhD students mm -hmm. who fanned out across the UK yeah. and they're teaching parapsychology and doing research. And he was one of my professors for a while okay. while I uh, got my degree in, at Berkeley. I don't know if you know this story that when he won the position for the chair, mm -hmm. the psych department was nervous to even bring it up. Yeah. Later on, they were bragging about the, they were the center of parapsychology because, as you know, uh, Professor Morris was not, he was head of the British Psychological Society. Mm -hmm. He was well respected in the UK, mm -hmm. and he was not nuts, yeah. <laughs> to use a technical term. Well, uh, and it's wonderful that we have uh, such people in the field. There are some yeah. very distinguished people doing work in parapsychology. Yes. You were certainly one of them. Thank you. Uh, Robert Morris, that you, whom, whom you mentioned, Stanley Krippner, would, yeah. would be another person who is well regarded uh, in their own disciplines. Well, what I've loved about it, there's both upside and downside about uh, interdisciplinary research. Mm -hmm. People like you are one of the best people I know that can put this out in a proper venue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very important part of this. I know people who are psychologists. I know people who are spiritually oriented and so on. It's a multidiscipline task. No yeah. single one's going to solve mm -hmm. the problem. Well, Ed May, it's been a pleasure having this conversation with you, and I think it'll be very enlightening for our viewers for some time to come. Thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate being here. Thank you for being with me. Yes. And thank you for being with us.